Do they get me hyped? Because you have to be hyped to go through all the different, like, it's kind of like Indiana Jones or like a big heist. Like to get these deals going, you have to do whatever it takes. You have to put yourself out there. So you have to have that fire in you and the great clients light that fire in me. What do you promise your writers? I don't like looking necessarily like there's a template because I do think each writer is unique and has unique, you know, sense of, you know, uh, priorities for what they want. But I guess when you look at it, maybe not necessarily a promise is what I guess an expectation of a manager, you know, is that they need to be able to work together and look at like material and figure out which concepts may be more viable and develop them and then like take them out to market and you know doing these things are very very important you know to any writer and you know so it's not just putting somebody in a room because sometimes like you know you, you know writer just go have a meeting but why is the meet why are you having the meeting like is there is this person specifically looking for this kind of material like like i i think that's also important it's not just oh, let's just show off like here, have a meeting here because there's some pointless meetings in Hollywood. I'll tell you, like there's meetings that you'll leave with like they'll give you a water bottle and you're like, I got a water bottle and that was it. Like if I have a meeting, I want my clients to get paid at some point from that relationship. I want to make sure that it's the right person at the right time, that maybe it's not now, but six months from now, I get a phone call from this producer and says, I absolutely looking for that writer, you know, looking for that kind of writer that I met. So there is a there needs to be pragmatism from the beginning of like development of an idea to taking it out to establishing the, a network in the industry that you're not arbitrarily doing something. But I, I would never just go just write something or just meet somebody. It needs to have a purpose. So that's a lot of my goal is working in conjunction with a client. Sometimes that means also working with an agent, like an agent and a lawyer or a publicist. Like there's different collaborators that could get pulled into a team and each team's unique. And for me, I want to make sure that I have a great relationship and shorthand with all the members of the team. What do you not promise your writers? You know, I never like I, I never set like a like a, a frame like this is going to be this or it's or it's or it's not going to be that like I kind of keep it flexible but what I could say is this I'm a passionate person I believe in your work I'm going to do whatever it takes to advance you know you know our agendas that's so just to build like a, either building a viable business out of a client or if a client is already a business how to maintain that business and make it bigger and so do they have to exclusively work with you you make them sign something where they would only work with you? I, I don't I don't necessarily look at it like exclusively. So like I work with agents all the time. I love collaborating with the right agent. So like I could have an agent that I have a good, you know, already have a good relationship with and then they have qualities that they bring to the table. So for me, it's not proprietary over the client. I want to get the right agent, ideally, the right lawyer, and then some clients might, you know, want a publicist, maybe specifically for film festivals or one of the movie get, movies get released, work with the publicist. So to me, it's almost like each client is its own unique business that we're working together. So, you know, a manager and agent could have multiple businesses running at once. It's different than being a producer, you know, where you have a movie, most likely you make the film, it gets released, everyone makes their money, it's done. Unless it's like a franchise or just spin-offs, but let's say it's just a normal film, a client is a is gonna always be a you know building new opportunities and potentially could take assignments or sell something. So there's so many more variables as an individual than it than it's just a one-off you know movie that gets released. So to me, it's just being receptive to those needs and seeing opportunities as they present themselves. What do you look for in a client? I think that like the client that I want to work with connects my taste. So I think that like anybody in this industry, just because like if let's say a manager or an agent passes on them, it doesn't mean that they're not amazingly talented. 
It just means that maybe that rep has different tastes. Like my tastes are not like, it's not like math. You know, it's not like this indisputable thing. It's more like, this is a fact. Is this person, you know, good or bad? It's more like I read the script, you know, I watch a movie and then I'm passionate. Like it moves me emotionally because I do think that like, you know, we live in a, we live, like living's hard. Like how, like just the day to day, it's just like you get apathetic, you had a hard day or whatever. And sometimes you're just like, all right, this day felt like the next day and you're like, whatever. But if you read a really good script, it stops time. You're like, oh my God, like I'm feeling this writer's voice. Like it, it, it just is moving me. And that's the kind of uh, client that I want is that they move me specifically. They not might, they might not remove the other manager, you know, at this company and that's fine. Or vice versa. There might be a totally viable client that doesn't excite me, but another manager loves working with them. So it's very specific to my curation is going to be that. Do they get me hyped? Because you have to be hyped to go through all the different, like, it's kind of like Indiana Jones or like a big height. It's like to get these deals going, you have to do whatever it takes. You have to put yourself out there. So you have to have that fire in you. And the great clients light that fire in me. Um, and now beyond that aspect of it, we also need to have like a good back and forth. Like it needs to be like, hey, we're working together because we like, you know, we like each other enough. You know, it doesn't mean like, oh my God, like this client, this client is exactly like me. I'm not looking for me. I don't care if they're different backgrounds, everything. To me, it's not like I'm looking for like, uh, I want to rap myself. I want to rap voices that excite me because I never see anything like it. That's what gets me into it. So, so I'm just mean that we have a relationship that is really about listening to each other and respecting each other and open to different ideas. And once you have the, the work that makes you get moving and get going and making, making things happen, plus you have that partnership where we could adapt to like we're saying the chaos of of anything that is thrown at us that's like the ideal client for me when you say chaos what kind of chaos could come up i think that like the entertainment industry is unlike a lot of other fields uh because how quickly it mutates there's always new opportunities but at the same time, there could be new risks. So what you think you would know, let's say from the 90s, may not work now. Or what you just, it's just everything's rapidly changing, which is why, you know, it's also kind of fun because you're like, who knows what's happening next? But it just means you just have to keep your eye out there and see what's happening and be like tapped in to, to these innovations. And that's, you know, to me, what the chaos is. It's like, and that, bleeds into your day-to-day -to -day too. So on a macro level, there's all these shifts, but it creates ripple effects that you feel, you know, immediately. And that's what you have to be okay with. You're not getting into this uh, business because you're like, you want something that's very like stagnant. You get into it because you want something that could just be super compelling all the time because you don't know what's gonna happen next. And to me, that's why I'm excited about my work. Do you like to be kept guessing sometimes? It's not that I wanna be kept guessing, is that like, I've always been interested in media and technology. Like, I've always been interested in movies, how they're distributed, how they're monetized. So for me, I love just seeing like, I love seeing this world shifting and seeing new, new like possibilities like, so when you see Netflix and suddenly you watch like, you know, a limited series that Queen's Gambit on, you're like, wow, like that's possible. Like I haven't seen a limited series like that before. So like to me, it's about getting inspired. Like, you know, I'm very open to finding inspiration as new projects get made and new businesses advance. And then you could see like an opportunity like podcasting. Podcasting is started to blow up and it's so much fun to also manage some podcasters and work with them and work on those unique deals that are starting to surface from major companies. So that's what gets me and it's the inspiration around these new, uh, new innovations. That's what gets me like 
you know, interested in the next, you know, the next one. And you had a podcast yourself? Yeah, I had a, a podcast called Hollywood 2.0. And it was basically a podcast that covered the intersection of media and technology. And we talked to everybody from like uh, people who create virtual reality, people who created distribution companies digitally. And it was exciting to just see like what the, you know, trailblazers are doing. And did you notice, I don't know what year you started that, mm -hmm. by the way? I don't remember exactly when I started. I did it for a few years and, you know, before I was a manager. And it just was, it was also fun. It was like seeing it and then seeing how other people are experiencing the industry and, and where it's going. Because the people I talked to were the ones that are always on the bleeding edge of innovation. So somebody could be from like the Sundance uh, you know, innovation, you know, stu Sundance studying virtual reality and innovation and, and that speaker could be coming from that point of view. So to me, it was fun to um, watch these businesses evolve. And some of them actually, uh, one of them got acquired. One of the, the, the founders like sold a, uh, a podcast company. So it was really cool to see the acquisition and see money move into the podcast space. And that was like the early sign of the, you know, signals of things to come. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. In a lot of ways, I keep doing it like through my work by seeing, you know, maybe a movie that I have a client makes could also be a TV show. Like, how do you spin off a film into TV? And that's starting to become like you start seeing that people are thinking in that way. Like, you'll see a show um, that will be starting as a movie. And like recently, there was a great film that's on Netflix called The Hater. And that was, uh, you know, sold to HBO as a TV show pitch. So that's a, something that's really unique to me. I'm like, wow, like you could do that? So that's why I get inspired, but it's like, what if I got it, one of my client's movies and sold it? Like that kind of thing always keeps me, uh, keeps me thinking. Should a writer seek out a manager or should they wait till the manager seeks them out? I think that like they should seek out a manager for sure, but I do think that there's uh, effective ways to do that. For instance, seeing in the roster, is there somebody that you have a personal relationship to so you could go through, you know, ideally like a friend who may be repped by a manager, uh, that could be helpful. Sorry, so you said a roster? Like, so a manager might have a, you know, like uh, multiple clients that are, um, that they work with, you know, and uh, one of them might be the friend of a writer who's unrepped and then they just like might just go to somebody in that you know who that manager reps and a writer or whoever and then just say hey you know i'd love to get my work to your manager could you know make an introduction so that's a way to do it um another way to do it is you basically just go you know go through like just an email you have an email query you know a letter where you just send it and I think that they just need to be really simple. Like, hey, my name is such and such. Uh, I have a science fiction uh, script. Um, I would love for you to check it out. Here's the log line. If you're interested, I'm happy to sign like a, a script release. Just uh, no one just wants to get exposed to a bunch of material legally. So just saying, hey, I'm open to sign that, you know, keep it simple. That's great. Like that's all you know. Just a very simple email, and ideally, you research the managers because, like, I don't really work with a lot of like you know like purely comedy clients. Like, it's just not my, you know, it's not my wheelhouse. And you know, sometimes people just will be like, "You're a manager," but they don't see that I have a specific curation. So I think you really need to know who you're contacting, or else you're wasting your time. And I think that like there doesn't need to be a whole narrative to that email. It needs to be something that you could just pick up your iPhone and just read it and go, okay, do I like this log line? Does that interest me? You know, because sometimes I get these emails that are super long and I don't have a lot of bandwidth, you know? So for me, it's just like, it's almost like diminishing returns on making it too wordy. It's almost better just to say, my concept is so hot, like you're gonna wanna read the script. It's gonna be, you're just gonna read it and you're gonna go, tell me more. And that's enough. But, you know, sometimes you get too much information. And, you know, I think that it's not the, the right uh, way to move forward because it's just as confusing because you're like, what did this person want? Who are they? It just becomes more about it. If it's like, 
here's an idea, let's talk, you know? And I think that's the, the key to do is just keep it simple. What is a script release? Like some type of like, you know, paperwork that, you know, they sign that so, you know, you're not, you know, connected to their script if you somehow 10 years later have a, you know, slightly similar project. It's just like it's it's customary for almost all managers, you know, to have some level of protection for being exposed to new work. So it releases you of liability I mean, in case they feel that there's another script out there similar to theirs. I guess. I mean, it's just normal. I mean, whatever, you know, any way to frame it. I mean, it's just no one wants to, like, get a bunch of scripts sent to them and, sure. and then somehow is there a connection to other materials. It just keeps it simple. It's just a professional way um, when you're exposed to new work. And, you know, it's just smart for any manager to not just get random, you know, emails of scripts. So, you know, you know someone's not really familiar with the businesses if they start by emailing you their script. They should always, like, be clearly open to, like, signing that release. At what point should a writer reevaluate whether they're ready to approach a manager or agent? I don't, you know, I think that like ideally they have like a body of work that, you know, speaks to their voice. So let's say they, you know, write in the romantic comedy genre. If they have a few scripts that really are like reflective of who they are, then why not? You know, I think um, they should try out, you know, the different you know, steps to getting a rep, I think it's valuable. Now, if someone is not really clear on what they want to do and they're still kind of discovering what gets them excited, then maybe they should just kind of like have fun and make things and then kind of find their their voice later and, and there's no pressure to have a rep. You don't need one as, you know, as a creator. You could just do your own thing. But I think it, it it's, it's valuable when you have a, a sense of what kind of, you know, um, you know, creator you want to be, what genre you want to work in, who do you want to collaborate with. So the more specific you get about what you're passionate about is probably a time where maybe a rep could be valuable. How common is it for a manager to part ways with their client? I mean, I think it's like case by case. I don't think there's like a frequency or a normal way to do it or you know, where it's like more or less uh, given, you know, like the manager, like there's not like, I guess a way, like a framework where you could point to like, this is what's typical. But, you know, I just think that in general, like, you know, people who are working together on a regular basis should have like, you know, they can't always have a shared vision. That's not, I mean, nobody you work with in any profession is always completely aligned. But I think that it has to be in the in a, in a certain like level of communication where there's a mutual respect and the paths that you've embarked on are um, accepted and ex and they excite you know, you and your uh, collaborator versus a huge schism and sense of you know strategy. So yeah, I mean it's just case to case. You know I think you just have to work with people that get you excited and get you passionate. So I think that's the most important part and whether or not there's a departure or they're not, I mean, that's fine. You know, you, you really have one life to live. You wanna enjoy who you work with. Sure, because there can be people that are, they're brilliant at what they do and then maybe temperament wise, they're not a match or vice versa. There can be people that, as you said earlier, you wanna hang with, but maybe talent level, they're not there yet, yet. You know, um, I think that like you just want to work with people that you believe in, you know, and and they have to believe in you too. So there, that's a you know, it's the collaboration, and you know that there's a you know there's going to be challenges, you know, in all facets of the business, but you're fine with them, you know. Like I said, it's all about adaptation. So can you work together as everything shifts and you have to keep coming up with new ways to to find the win. Because at the, that's what we want to do. We want to push to go forward. We want to keep moving. We want to keep progressing. And I think that's the goal is that the people you're working with have that, you know, the same vision to lead to being a successful filmmaker, you know. And I think that, like, same with, you know, as a manager, you share the success with your clients, you know, something, 
you feel the wins too. So I think that the question is, do your client and you have a have that partnership that's meaningful? And if there is problems and either of the person doesn't want to work together, that's fine. You know, they could work with somebody else or vice versa. It's not a tragedy. It's just you have to work with people that you find it a fulfilling profession to be part of this team. And that's what that's what matters is that the, at the end of the day, you need to just sell the project, you know, and you feel good. You like that you like what the person's about. You like what you, you really enjoy the the getting there. It's not just that one sale. It's like the the communication was in place. You know, you guys like you get excited about the same movies, you know. So I think that, you know, it's fine if relationships part because then maybe there's a, another rep who connects with them in a, in, a, in a better way. So it's not about just collecting random people. It's about building successful teams. And it's great to have belief in people. But unfortunately, in the real world, people will let you down and mm -hmm. maybe they don't try to maybe it's not intentional. But have you ever had to have a conversation with someone that says, you know, I need you to be more on point or we had this meeting, you didn't show up. You don't have to give me specifics as to who someone is, but where they weren't holding up their end of the bargain and you had to have, quote, the talk. Honestly, no, like I don't want to have that talk. I mean, I think that, you know, there is a period where you're talking to a potential client and you just have to be honest like with uh, them about how you like the work and you know maybe you talk to their collaborators about their experience working with them and just get a sense of like what's important you sure. know and when you know what's important to a collaborator and they know your values I don't have issues about performance so it's not like somebody's like slipping is that we've already kind of got through it in the initial like introduction and uh and you know teaming up okay what if someone has some dry periods in their life where they're not creating anything would you retain them as a client i mean like everybody has to work their own way like there isn't like it's not a mechanical process. It's not like they're making widgets, you know, is that it's deeply personal to tell a story. You know, it's not something that you could just, you know, turn into a system where you could just do a paint by numbers process. And if you could, it'd probably be a terrible movie. Um, it, that's not what I want. They, they might have to take time, you know, so when there's a collaborator and they're like, hey, I need some distance to kind of come up with an idea or, you know, to work on a project, that's fine. I have plenty of clients that are in the mix of something new. So the only area where that could be problematic, and I haven't dealt with that personally, but if somebody's hired to do a job and then they can't execute on it, that's where that becomes a problem. Not when they need time to, you know, write a new spec. It's when there's a contract sign and, you know, money has exchanged hands and somebody's like paralyzed. That could be an issue for sure. Like, but it's not a, to me, it's not a big deal if a storyteller needs to sit back and like watch movies, like live a little bit, run around, do different things, and then just lock in to a vision for a project like uh, my brother's a filmmaker and I see him sometimes like he'll have to walk into a museum or he'll do something or he'll go somewhere and then he'll get his mind activated so I've seen it growing up and my dad is also an author he's written some historical uh you know novels he needs to just kind of like get that groove so it's fine to me I don't have an expectation that a person has to constantly be churning out material uh, they whatever they need to get, you know, the ideas, you know, building, you know, and moving forward is fine with me. But if someone has an advance on a book and they have a, a contractual obligation to turn in some type of pages at a certain time and they haven't, 
you've never had to deal with. No. You know, and then you're calling and there's no return calls and, you know, you've never had to face that. No, like the, the when the when the contract is signed, I've had clients just get to work, you know. That's good. It's not no, precious at all. They just do their job. And I know sometimes like you'll see um you know, in movies, this like, you know, author who's like, you know, <laughs> totally out to lunch and not in the game at all. And then their agents calling or whatever, you know, but like for pages, no, I haven't dealt with that. They're, you know, they're working on a project to professionals and they're delivering, uh, you know, on time. Okay. So you haven't had any scenes of like factotum or barfly where you have to go and pull someone out of the corner bar and get them in front of the typewriter? No, not at all. Like, uh, it's, it's, it's not that, you know, unfortunately, it's not that exotic. It's not like a, a movie. It's just kind of like this do their thing. Like, if you're hiring somebody in any profession. Good. Okay. Sounds like you have a good intuition as to who you take on. So yeah, good. definitely. How do you know if a writer is talented? I can only speak to what gets me, you know, super interested in them and ultimately, you know, like just kind of their general, you know, portfolio, what they've written, you know, who they worked with. But there's something about the writing that cuts through all the clutter. And that's the that's the project that I, I want to support. And that's the, you know, storyteller that I want to get behind because it's somebody that like writes something that just like freezes time and Nothing else matters. You know, your phone is buzzing every day and you get just, you know, meaningless messages. And, you know, on social media, you'll get like little updates that somebody likes something or whatever. But look, it's not, nothing's that big of a deal. But if the writing to me is truly powerful. All those insignificant distractions just kind of like uh, start to dim and move into the background and the only thing that's important is uh the characters that they created what's your process for evaluating a writer's skill level when you think about nothing but the the control they have on you like a great writer like well um almost like the work will just like take you away from every everything uh that doesn't matter that's not the work so I look at like, you know, how distracted, you know, the average person is right now. And if, if you're a really good writer, you could just pull them away from that life where everything is like a 24 second news cycle and nothing really matters. Uh, but you, you know, you get that dopamine hit anytime you check your phone and, uh, somebody who could really take you out of that and make you really, you know, give a shit about these, you know, characters that that they came out that came out of their mind, and that is more important to you than um, those distractions. And you live in that world, you know, for a while. That's that's where you know that the person, you know, has the chops. How do you know they if they don't have the chops? Maybe not yet. Well, there's a, I would say there's a spectrum of like qualities that you could look at, uh, you know, a potential client. Um, there's somebody that you could read the first 10 pages and, you know, you could just say, maybe it's just not for you. You know, maybe just like the tone, you know, maybe it's too quirky and you like things a little bit more grounded. So that's not necessarily a talent thing, right? But then there's something that you see that could be totally incompetent. Like it's just bad writing and it's not about your taste because I know what I like and I know when there's really talented, uh, you know, writers working in a space that I'm not interested in. It doesn't mean they're bad. It's just not something that, that I'm passionate about. But I think you can know pretty quickly if it's a taste thing or is it um, they just need a lot more uh, experience and they're just, you know, their work is rough. I think you'd said on the final draft podcast, which was excellent, by the way, your interview with them, that there was a writer that was doing something about um, these kids that were part of this magazine sales thing across mm -hmm. the country, and they would travel together, and these were like 
they were it was almost like a group home but like a traveling yeah. you know some of these kids that maybe were unfortunately wards of the court or something and can you talk about that so who was that writer i don't remember where i got that idea 100 percent. i just knew that there there might have been like a story i think about these uh traveling uh, uh magazine salespeople that were young like you know, basically teenagers running around peddling these subscriptions. And they were kind of like a ragtag group of individuals and they had an interesting life to, you know? So for me, like, I, I don't like using the term like, oh, it's just like, oh, it's a high concept idea. I mean, that's fine, you know, but I almost look at it like, tell me an idea that when you tell, when I hear about it, I want to know more. That's, I think that's the test and not have some weird metric for it. But like if someone tells me about a vigilante that went around the, you know, the, you know, like the beginning of America and fought like criminals and they were, you know, mysterious and they were never found and we don't know who it could have been. I'm like, oh, I like vigilantes. I love mystery. So like there's obviously certain boxes that could be checked for what I would find an interesting idea that may not always work with other people. So that's what I'm saying. There's not a there's not a science to what is a compelling concept, um, but I can know what it gets me interested. And and when you look at like the blacklist or the blood list, those log lines are really cool. Like, you know, these are great, these are great writers and they have ideas that want makes you want to know more. You know, that's what it is. It's not because it's like a gimmick or something. It's because there's something interesting there. How do you know if a writer is capable of writing at a professional level? If they move you emotionally, um, because it's about emotions. It's about making people feel something. And there's writers that can write to the form perfectly and you read it and it's fine, but it doesn't make you feel anything. In the same way, like I listen to music almost like a drug. Like I'll listen to music that will get me hyped. I'll get I'll listen to music that will mellow me. Like it moves you. You could use uh, this, you know, the audio experience to change your state of mind. Movies, in my opinion, could do the same way. There's movies that will that get you hyped and disturbed. Movies that will like make you kind of like have comfort food. They have qualities to them. And I think that the key to know if a writer is somebody that you want to work with is you are being affected. It's changing your state of mind in a, in a powerful way. And if it's just the script and you read it and it's totally derivative, you just feel like it's like a bad cover band. Like who, know, who wants to watch the, the cover band? You want to watch Kiss play, you know, or whatever it is. You want to see the, ideally you want to see the, the purest form of that vision. And, and when I speak to the sense of a cover band is you want somebody's authentic voice and that's what you're getting. You want the purest version of who they are. And that's going to get you really into their work. If those hooks get in you, because you're feeling someone who's very unique as speaking to you through the work and changing your, uh, emotional, you know, levels, you know, and that's what art does. It affects you. So I think for me to gauge whether or not someone's professional is like, am I getting excited? Am I getting scared? Am I disturbed? Like, like, is it, is it influencing me? And if it's not, maybe I don't like the genre or whatever, or the tone, that's fine. Or maybe the writer needs to do another few rewrites to really refine, you know, their vision. So are there are there writers that are versions of cover bands? I mean, sometimes I've heard some amazing cover bands, by the way. But yes, sometimes it's it's a watered down version of your favorite artist. But are there are there cover band writers? I don't know if there's exactly like I would say purely a cover band writer. And like there are awesome cover bands. Like don't get me wrong. I mean, there's some that really have their own you know take on something, or kind of almost supernaturally capture the essence of a musician that you love, uh, which is also really cool. I'm just saying that, you know, maybe there is like a version of a cover band that feels kind of hacky, you know, that doesn't hit all the beats, doesn't have that 
you know, excitement, that intangible quality that made you fall in love with a band. They're, they're good enough, right? And you're like, okay, I've seen that before. It's, so why am I seeing it like this? It feels like the, the watered down version. That's different. There are writers that are very nostalgic and they, in a lot of ways, they sample openly certain qualities that you might like from a movie from the 80s, but they make it their own. You know, they're not just, they're not like stealing from anything. They're extracting the essence of it. And then you're seeing something, uh, you're seeing a point of view. So I guess that's what I would say is the point of view, maybe not a point of view on, let's say like, this is a point of view on a theme, that's a universal theme and they talk about it. It could be a point of view on a genre. So maybe they're talking about slashers, but it's a really interesting hot take. It's in the same way you think of like a, a great film critic could talk about a movie and really make you think about it and, f and really feel something different about that movie. A writer that could have these perspectives, I wouldn't call a cover band, I would say they're offering insight into storytelling and maybe in a meta quality or something that's really fascinating. I'm talking about, what I'm talking about here is somebody is uninspired that is not offering anything new to the, intellectually or maybe emotionally, then it's just, why do we need another X? Okay. So it's like a cover band and you said Kiss. So it's like you've gone to a, a bar and they're playing Detroit Rock City, but it's like slow and it's, it's kind of distorted. And you're like, uh, almost, but not quite. Like, ooh, this almost hurts my ears. So it's the same thing. A writer's trying to emulate, let's say, J.K. Rowling and they're trying, but it's it's like, no, I see what they're trying to do and they're speed, they're trying to emulate her voice. They're emulating it without offering a new perspective. You know, because there are because in a lot of ways, like, you know, certain certain creators are almost like like I was saying, like critics, is they're using their work to almost be uh, you know, to comment on a type of character or type of genre. And that actually to me is actually really interesting. Mine's like the, my criticism uh, of a certain type of writer is when they're not bringing anything new to the table. Their perspective is, is not defined and then they're just recycling and it just, and you really don't get anything out of it. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. So yeah, like there's an amazing cover bands, but I'm talking about the cover band where you're like, why don't I just watch the, the actual <laughs> band? Like that's the one, not someone that goes, oh my God, I thought I was there. Or, you know, like who am I, who's on stage? Or wow, this is a crazy subversion of the song. Like the Pixies have had like a million covers of their big song, you know, where's my mind? But the good cover is really take you somewhere different. Okay, so it kind of like, almost like prog rock of something that wasn't yeah. meant to be that way. It or it captures it beautifully. Uh -huh. Like I'm open to those things, but I'm talking about the end of the day, the, the type of script that when I'm done reading, I don't get anything emotionally or intellectually new from my baseline experience. How does the writer know that they are the original writer? That this is their voice? They have to serve their perspective. In the same way as a manager, I have to be honest to myself, you know, what, you know, material gets me, you know, into the game and gets me, you know, ready to like go out and start selling and and pushing projects is I have to believe in it, you know, it has to be real to me. And in a lot of ways it has to be real to them. You know, when you see a lot of filmmakers starting out, like in the early stages, like somebody might come out of film school and they may look to a director that they love and almost do their own version of a cover band because they're just trying to learn the technology. They're learning the, the craft. But then as they mature, they advance beyond that, and then they start cultivating a voice. They may have certain genetic, you know, quality, you know, the genetics of their favorite filmmakers, but it's also a new statement they're making in the space that is only theirs. Because I think we can all think that we're original, you know, like, but if I, let's say I'm always reading Joyce Carol Oates novels, that I'm gonna probably allow that to seep into my writing style and maybe not even be aware of it. So how do I know, is it from feedback from outside sources? Is that the only way we really know if we're being authentic? I think that like, it's fine if somebody goes, I am a Alfred Hitchcock super fan and that's gonna inspire my work. But it's where we go from there. 
Like I think some people, you know, could look at, you know, the, the amount of filmmakers that that one, you know, auteur just influenced, and there's just so many countless, you know, students of this director. But it's what they do with it. Why is it interesting? You know, and the only way to know how your work resonates is have people read it. So like, maybe somebody could write something that's in the the vein of another creator, but what they end up making is still impactful. So you're measuring impact, not some type of purity test of originality. Is you give someone your script, they get moved emotionally and intellectually. That's that's what the goal is. So yeah, I, I don't wanna make it so like I'm evaluating, does it have to be perfectly original or whatever that means. I don't know if that even means anything I'm talking about what are do people love the experience? Does it experience is it is it memorable? Uh, that's what matters. I don't want to get into like that director sampled this and that like to me it's like I don't care. I like I like collage artists. I like artists that take things. I like uh, producers that produce music and they sample like other artists and they make something interesting but they have to make something interesting i think that's what i'm evaluating is the experiential quality not whether or not they you know were clearly inspired by somebody else that's not uh the metric do you have an example of maybe a film you watched in college where it just it changed you somehow for better or worse i don't think like any movie like it's like a that I was actually changed by. I do see, I do see movies that I just get excited by. Like, and I don't know if there was like some you know spiritual experience where I was like, whoa, I've, everything's changed. But I do really love um, certain movies by John Waters or Tarantino or like Takeshi Kitano. Like, I see what they could do, or you know, Elaine May. Like, there's people making things and they you know like i don't know how they did that it just I, it blew my mind i mean it's almost like if you're like you know a food critic and you go to some restaurant and you bite into something and you're like whoa what just happened here you know like there's something like I, something's going on i can't put a finger on it but it's really working so i don't think there's this one thing i think it's more of like a, a mix of a lot of different experiences but i think I think when you're done with it, you're like, I want to watch every movie they made. Like, I want to watch whatever they have next. Or if they're not live, I just want to move through their entire like library and check out what they have going on. So to me, that that's how I feel. It's just you get excited. It's excitement. That's what we're measuring or not. It's not. It's not like we pull out our measuring stick and we go. We're measuring the perfect exact thing. When you, it's like, it's like, you know, when you say holy shit that is great and it's so good you want to tell everybody about it that's how you know it matters is that you want to share it with somebody that's why that's why i think it's kind of like when you want to push a movie on somebody else it's not just like casually talk about a movie like there's a movie um called pale flower it's a yakuza crime film it's old black and white film it's so good i have influenced like five of my friends to watch it so when you're getting other people to get into whatever you're into that's how you know it worked Obviously, but like that's how I know that a film has deeply resonated is that I'm now representing the movie as a super fan. Does it have subtitles? Yes. Oh, so it's a Japanese film? Mm -hmm. uh, what year is it from? Not sure. It was like something that like I found and then I just started pushing to people who I think would like it. So then I start like recommending it and telling everyone I know about it. So. That's how I look at it is that I don't, I don't, I don't have one special experience, but I just know the physic, the actual events that take place in my mind when I see a movie like that, or I see, or specifically I could point to a filmmaker where I'm like, that person's doing something really exciting. And then I just, you know, for the rest of my life, I'm, I'm pushing that filmmaker or their movie on anyone in the air shot. Can you give us an example of how you helped one of your writers sell their scripts and get a movie made? So yeah, I have a, a project that I sold um, and we basically worked on developing the pitch together and we brought together the right producers and team and made attachments. 
And we had to pitch on Zoom, which made it very challenging because this was during the pandemic. So this was a project to just make, make which made it crazy is we sold a movie during a like dystopian, you know, event. Like we're, it, we, we can't leave our, our place. So we prepped it on Zoom and it was extremely like challenging because you know, a lot of the process of selling an idea is very physical. You're in a room together and it's, it's, it's something that you have to have a presence. But when you're on a laptop like Max Headroom and you're just like a floating head, it makes it infinitely more difficult to sell a project. So, you know, we had a tough situation, you know, how do we make something really good because we had, you know, a studio executives that were going to be on a Zoom call. So we decided that, you know, the pitch that we just make 20 minutes, make it just the best 20 minutes possible. Because, you know, at a certain point, the attention span of most people starts diminishing, especially on a screen. If you're in the physical world, it's so much easier to just like be compelling and have that kind of like energy that everyone feeds from. But when you're looking at like, you know, your laptop, it's like completely different. So we decided that, you know, making it shorter was better. And the goal was in the questions and answers, we'd be able to activate more interest and get more information. So we shortened this pitch way smaller than we'd ever do in a, in a normal event. We'd make it much longer if we were in, in that room. So we shortened it, really practiced it. We ran the pitch through multiple people. We actually had, and I think some people don't get it, is that like pitching is like writing. You have to iterate. Like I think some people think you just show up and pitch. But actually pitching is kind of a, when you think of like a performer, like a comedian, they might even record their sets just to hear, do they hit all the beats? Is it, does it, does it really resonate? Or a musician could perform at a show and then see people and really get a sense of, does that set work? So we had the writer go through all these cycles of prepping with different types of people because we didn't know the energy that was going to be given in that. And ultimately through defining the, the size of the pitch, prepping through multiple people, during this horrible event that we were living, everybody was living in, we were able to sell a movie um, despite those challenges. And it resonated perfectly with the buyers. So, I mean, that is an event that, like, collectively, we weren't looking at the pitch as such something that's ready made. And I think that's a problem with a lot of filmmakers. They're like, yeah, just get ready for the pitch. But a pitch, you should even, to me, look at it like a, like a script. You get the script, you kind of come up with the idea and you just refine it and you iterate and you just keep making it better and better. A pitch should be the same way. You should be able to try it on different people, workshop it, see where people are at, and don't just pitch people that are already working on it. Like if you're just, oh, I just talked to my collaborator, you should get individuals who are new to what you're talking about and they should have notes for you. What ideas resonated? Do you rush by exposition? How did it develop? And really just making sure that the timing is right. And, you know, um, is it exciting? Do you get all the information across? And we really had this criteria. And ultimately it was successful because we were taking that seriously. I have a TV pitch going out soon. We're doing the same thing. Um, because right now we're, we're still, you know, getting past, you know, this horrible situation to ultimately be in the real world. But I think that was the valuable, you know, you know, experience was taking that part of the equation as seriously as writing that amazing script. Because if it's just the pitch, it's about trust. Why should we trust you to be the one that gets hired to, you know, write something? And you need to put that work in because the person that you're pitching to, if they're valuable, if they're like high, you know, high powerful, you know, executive on the top of, of a major company, they don't have a lot of time. So you can't just kind of waltz in and throw ideas around. You have to like really just shit test your presentation to the point where it's fantastic. 
It doesn't matter how long you've done it too. Like it's not just doing it once. Maybe you do it 10 times, maybe you do it more, but it has to be at a point where a new person who's never heard of this project sees it. And if it's done on Zoom, if that's where the situation is, it's fine. You move them, you get them to go, this is something that I want to get behind. And that's uh, what was successful. You know, I sold multiple projects. So I think that you have to, when you sell these new, you know, films or TV shows, you want to make sure that the energy that of your idea is transferring and the information is to people who don't have the same level of relationship that you do. And it could have been harder uh, during the during that time to get make this work because it was so unnatural to everybody involved. But once we were okay with it, we're like, this is our our frame a screen, this is the attention span, we designed it to the user, to the, to the individual who has the power to say yes. And that's why I was successful. And that's my, uh, my role in this project was making sure that the pitch was ready for showtime. Do you have the writer film themselves and then you critique it or they even watch themselves back to see how are they coming across in the pitch? I don't have them look at themselves on video, but what I do is I firm it up with them and then I just recommend them just testing it on, you know, people they respect. So get to the right length and you're just hitting those beats over and over again. It's almost like you want to make it feel like it's natural, but it's not. It's designed. You know when you do a certain expression or you know when you pause, they're going to lean in. It's so designed that you're kind of taking them on a, on a journey, but you know where the tracks are. Do you think most writers take too long to get to the point? Because by nature, they love writing, they love communicating, and they need to shorten their message. I think there's no one, you know, experience I've had on the, on the pitching front, but I do think that it's very important and that the people that you want to bring on as stakeholders in your, in, your, in your movie or your TV show, they have a little window and you have to get them to care because they might not, they might not start caring. You have to take them from potentially apathy to really being invested. And that's the journey you have to take them, take them on. And it's really, there's no one approach and there's no one writer with a certain temperament it's all across the board but the more you cycle through feedback and really perfect it you have a better chance of resonating with the right people so a great writer and a great pitch turns apathetic people into sitting up straight in their chair i mean they may not give you any tells because an individual might just be like this the whole time mm. so you might not know it's not to be totally clear it's not they're gonna applause or anything they're gonna give a big applause at the at the end of it they might give you a poker face okay because maybe they don't want to give you anything during this time frame because when you sell something they're spending money you know and maybe it's maybe it's an investor maybe it's someone who you know has a fund, or maybe they know someone of money, whoever it is, someone's taking a risk. So you might not get like any tells that it's resonating. You might just get a very apathetic expression. But if they have all the information they need to make a decision, once it's over, behind closed doors, they might say it was pretty cool but they might not give that to you during that time because they might lose power. They have more of ability to really think it through if there's a wall that's up over here because then they could think about it. They could talk to collaborators and really discuss the opportunity. Doesn't matter if they have a reaction or not. You know you've tested it on all the right you know, individuals that give you feedback. So regardless of the emotional reaction of who's listening at the end of the day is you know you're ready. That's what matters. Almost envision yourself at like a 
live poker, you're watching live poker on TV and you see these people with the dark shades and the, and the, and the cap pulled down and almost envision yourself pitching in front of them and you know there's going to be no reaction. No, they're not even going to scratch their nose to give away some kind of discomfort or nervousness. Absolutely. But there could be another type of, you know, potential buyer who talks all the time. So you just want to be able to test your pitch out on all sorts of personalities if you don't know who you're pitching. Is it just going to be like a quiet, you know, room that has low energy? That could be the case. Or somebody keeps cutting you off. You have to be ready and flexible to get your message out in a confident, professional way. So there could be high energy, hyper, almost like a caged animal type of a pitch, not on the writer's part, but of the of the person being pitched. You just don't know who they are. Right. Okay. I mean, it's just like anybody. You know, we all have different personalities. If you don't know who you're pitching, you could be ready for any type of energy. You pull them in and they really feel something you might know. You might not know. It doesn't matter. You just need to know you're ready for it. With this call, this Zoom pitch that you're talking about, how many people were on the call and then Thinking was the project um, purchased after the Zoom call, like immediately after? I think it was might have been five or six. I don't really completely remember, you know, everybody that was on it. But it was about, I feel it was about five or six. And it, it wasn't bought on the call. Um, there was like, you know, we heard later. You know, typically I haven't experienced anything that just happens in the moment where somebody would commit to, to that. It, it typically has a bit of a delay where people have to regroup. Like, do you know how much, like, did you hear maybe a month later, a week later? I think it was, um, I think it was about a, a week or so. Okay, so you didn't lose too much sleep, but no, yeah. he, you were you were waiting, and then w once do you get do you get an email that says it's a go? We're having people draw up contracts, or do they have more questions? There were there really weren't any more questions on this event. It wasn't they didn't continue to like pull information from the players involved in this project. It was established on that uh, one pitch. Oh, okay. So then the email was basically, we love it. It's a, it's a green light. Yeah, the phone call was like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Nice. How long was the final curated pitch? Are you talking about the, the pitch that, does that include the Q&A afterwards? Oh, so, so there's the pitch and, and then, then the five Q &A. people. And there's a Q&A. Um, well, some people on the, who are being pitched have some questions, but it wasn't a lot. I would say in, in total, I think that this, this one, for about 30 minutes. Like, because what happens also too, it starts with a little bit of like, you know, small talk. So first is the small talk, then there's a pitch, and then there's like a little questions and answers. And that was it, so it was about a half an hour. And you know, this is a silly question, but in a, in a time of sensitivity, what is acceptable small talk? Because you could really say the wrong thing and you think you're joking and you're just being sarcastic, whatever. What is an acceptable realm of small talk and, and how should a writer behave? Just like any other job that the writer might have had, what is an expectation if you worked in an office or if you're a student in college? It's what you, know, you would uh, do in these settings that you just have to hold a, you know, a, a serious uh, presentation of yourself. It's not a a space to be acting, you know, so out of like, you know, out of that frame, because there's an expectation that when you're in this kind of room is that they're taking a risk on you. Uh, when you're trying to get somebody to invest in you and there's money on the line, why don't you go in their shoes? How do they, if you're them, what kind of person would you want to risk a fortune on? You know, and that should, you know, establish how you behave is you just have to have empathy for them. And if you do, then, you know, 
how you initially present yourself will be the right professional face. Well, there's different cultures in different workplaces. I've worked in some where, you know, nothing but the facts don't don't refer to anything that's not work related. Whereas there's others where people shared personal details of their life, and that was the norm. You know, it's probably too far on the spectrum, but just knowing, like reading the room, like going in, because some people might have a little bit of more of a looser style, but you don't want to overstep that bound, and that's an easy line to cross, especially these days. You know. Well, I mean. This is most likely a, a new relationship. Uh, in the, when I'm talking about, if you don't know what their approach to their business is, is that you might not know them that well or know them at all. If they're a stranger, then more of a neutral approach makes sense because you got the empathy that if this investor is going to finance your film. You could come at it with more of a baseline because you don't know them, and you don't have to perfectly match their energy. But you have to be respectful of what kind of dynamic they're going to get into if they're going to greenlight your movie. So I think the key is not leading with assumptions, and just imagining what it would be like to be sitting down in the other chair and having to take a major risk on someone you don't know or barely know. In the terms of this online pitch during the pandemic that、mm -hmm. we're referring to, was this an existing relationship, or did you start this during? Did you reach out to this person during the pandemic? I I'd say that some parties had a relationship with the buyers, some didn't. It was a mix. When you're working with a writer, can you explain how you reverse engineer their path forward? So in some situations. I like to think about where I want to be, and I start there, and then I walk backwards. So you're thinking, what kind of producer or director or actors you like to collaborate with? You know, what are your references to other movies that are in this space? So you might be thinking the expectation of the fans of a genre.、Uh, you might be thinking the scope of a movie. For example, there are horror films that are made for a hundred thousand dollars. Some of them are made for a few million, and then there's bigger budget ones that are mid range, which are in a whole other category. So, I want to know what model are we working in. The last thing you'd want to do is get a script that's unproducible, where the budget's just too big for the genre, typically, and. It's not going to work. You want to be able to have a general sense of, in a perfect scenario, who's on board to produce it, direct it, act in it, finance it. Is it from private financiers? Is it from a studio, or is it streamer going to back it? Like, get a general sense. I mean, obviously, these things could be flexible. So I'm not saying being stuck on it, but knowing what you're fulfilling a demand. You're not creating a demand. And I think that's important.、Uh, so on a on this kind of knowing where you where you fit in. Another part you also want to think about is what is it about this concept that makes it unique. Now I don't mean like making something that's so like esoteric and weird that it's unique because it's just strange. I mean like if we've seen a certain kind of bank heist film. What is it about it that's familiar, and what about it is a new way in? And I could talk about tonally, conceptually, the type of characters are in it, the plot. There's all sorts of room to make it new. So it's that balancing act. And if there's not enough unique elements in the story, you know, my worry sometimes is who's going to want it. It just feels kind of what's out there, and that's a problem. You could put all that work into writing it, yet there's ten other movies like it that just came out. So ideally, I want to know the business model, like how does this work? Who would want to be part of this collaboration potentially? And then on a creative level, what makes this special? And once we have achieved that, and we know there's space. 
then it works. Like I kind of look at it like there's a big whiteboard, okay? And the board has things already on it, like mark, marked it up, but there's a space on that board where your movie fit or TV show fits in. And the key is making sure the ideas feel like there's some room for it. It's not redundant and it's not just not tenable in the, in its, in the business model. So that really affects how I think about potential concepts to pursue developing into scripts. Have you ever had a client or potential client say, are you going to make this my career? Like if I work with you and sign with you, can I be guaranteed by within this amount of time, this will be my career? I'll be a working screenwriter, podcaster, producer. No. I have never experienced that approach. I mean, I'm sure some people have it and it's fine. But typically I'm dealing with somebody who's understands the complexities of the industry. So someone who would ask those questions, that's that's a big that's a newbie, that's an amateur. I don't know. I mean, you know, that individual that individual has the right to ask any questions to a potential manager. Um, I haven't encountered that. And I don't know if that means they're a newbie. I mean, you know, anybody could, you know, address their concerns or their ambition with the reps that they want to bring in to their team. That's totally fine. But I just haven't encountered somebody who would put that on the table. Would you say a lot of writers naturally think this way? in terms of reverse engineering their path. So maybe they don't know how things are going to turn out for them, but they want to try to see, okay, this is where I want to be. This is the level I want to be working at with these type of players. Now, how do I get there? I think every client has their own approach. I think as a manager, you want to think about how a project can go on a, a journey to it becomes a you know a very high quality you know experience once it's produced that it's successful not just because it got made critically and it has an incredible return on the investment of who buys into it that's important to me and I can't lose sight of the business when I look at you know, any project, uh, any ideas that we just start discussing. Now, will a writer have the, the mindset to reverse engineer their script? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's a theme they want to explore and that's totally fine. I don't think there's one way to bring something to life. You know, I think that whatever their whatever they're prioritizing in the inception of the idea and then how it develops. So it's all across the board. What do you say to the writer who says, I just do writing. I don't do anything else. I know my story is going to resonate. There's an emotional connection with the protagonist. Find someone else to produce it and market it and do all the heavy lifting. But I just wrote it and that's all I need to do. Well, that's fine. There's plenty of producers out there who love collaborating with great writers. I mean, it's a personal choice if somebody wants to be a hyphenite. It's, it's something that if that's what matters to them, then they should make that their focus. If, if a client just wants to write scripts, that should be their focus. You know, I don't want to do anything but manage and produce. I don't want to do any other capacity in this industry and that's my choice. So I don't expect a writer to have to act in it or direct it or produce or do anything beyond sitting down and, you know, working on developing new material. So you wouldn't be opposed to that if you had a potential client that said, I have things that I write. I know they're excellent. That's all I do. I don't do windows. I just, I just write. That's all I do. I mean, that's totally fine. I, I don't value that type of client more or less than somebody who wants to take on additional you know, responsibilities. Do you think it shows an attitude of being inflexible or they just do one thing and they don't want to dilute what they do? 
I don't see any inflexibility at all. There's an entire union, the WGA, that protects writers um, because this is a community that, in a lot of ways, you know, they build, they're like this. They build so much incredible, you know, stories, and they are part of uh, this industry in in, in, the, in the most meaningful way. There's no reason why a writer has to direct. It's it's you know, it's a choice. My brother is a writer who ultimately, you know, he was he that's what got him into the a lot of into the game, and now he's directing and then you start and he's also producing and he does that and I have friends who are actors who are also writers I mean you know in the same way uh, me you know as a manager like there's something compelling about working with incredible storytellers and that uh, is my passion and I, that's why I you know every day I, I, I get up and look forward to the next you know project and the next pitch or I get it keeps keeps me moving you know that's that energy that I get from my work because it's so well suited for me in the same way a writer if that process excites them there's no reason to do anything else so you can respect that someone who knows what they're great at and they know where their skills lie and they're not going to deviate from that just so that they can get a project moved along or they, if they're also you're okay with people being, as you say, a multi hyphenate. Yeah, I mean it's it's a spectrum. I mean there's people who do everything, and the and it's just incredible what they they have so many hats. But it's not for everybody, and I totally respect that. I don't look at it negatively if somebody really wants to just be a writer, because it's hard to to have that as their singular focus. So that doesn't mean that it's that much easier. That comes with a lot of challenges to be successful. So there's no expectation that somebody has to direct. And it doesn't also mean that if you're just a writer, you're not being pragmatic. Because if you write incredible work, you might find a director that you love working with and now you have a partner. And that director might not want to write. So that's like a perfect fit. What are those challenges? You said there are challenges that come with being successful? Well, you start with a blank page. That's hard. You, you know, you have to build a reality out of nothing. And there might be an incredible director who doesn't want to write a script, but you see their music videos or their short films and you think they have the right tone. So then you go, why don't we work together? You don't want to write, you just want to direct. And my, my passion is writing scripts. And then you team up and then you make something really exciting. So you want your client or potential clients to be comfortable in what they do and their skill set, and you don't try to push them to do more if that's not within them. It's just what they're passionate about. I have clients that create IP and they love writing comics or making podcasts. That's all they want to do. They don't want to write scripts. And that's fine because they're making something that really emotionally moved me. I don't need anything beyond what they already do. They, they're already successful. Being able to make you know, pieces of like art that are meaningful to uh, their audience and they get excited about them and that's hard that's not easy so changing the changing them into hyphenites is really just they're about their own personal interests and i can empower somebody who wants to expand new responsibilities and support that but at the same time, it has to be a natural progression of what they want to do. I have something I would love feedback on. It's a mashup time travel slash horror genre film. Our protagonist is Seth, and he has created a time travel app, which he calls the Time Me Up Scotty. Okay, So he's courting investors and hoping to launch the app. But before he has like this big investor meeting, he, you know, gets comfortable on a Friday night, has a bunch of beers, and he starts playing with the app. 
and accidentally his own app, which he, it's his own creation, transports him to Salem, Massachusetts in the year 1692. He finds himself in this time travel that's gone through in a cell awaiting trial, having been accused of throwing his specter as witnessed by disgruntled villagers, meaning that he's, his witnesses saw his image somewhere else, essentially accusing him of witchcraft. And the horror comes as he cannot prove his innocence and he's set to be crushed to death as punishment. So can you tell me your feelings on my pitch? I think it's kind of cool. Um, I like it because it kind of encapsulates what's scary about the past is that you can't reason with people that have a completely different frame, I imagine. I mean, I've never time traveled, so I can't speak to that. But I just think that it's interesting that what makes it scary is that it's an individual who is now living in this reality where there's no reference point for anybody else but himself. And it's taking that time travel genre and then really making it kind of like a horror movie in the sense of that it's kind of like the fish out of water, but done in a way where there's real threats. And now you have to deal with these threats. And I think that is what makes it interesting. So conceptually, I think there's a lot there, but the device to get to where it's really getting good, I think that might need a little bit of work because I, that it seems a little bit like there might be a more of a streamlined way. So you have a device that brings you into that time period. But once you're there, I'm really curious about what happens next. I have a little bit of backup, but that was on, on what happens. But that was my initial pitch. So if is would that happen then? If I were to pitch, let's say, some, some individuals, whether it's Zoom or in person, would they then, those are some of the notes possibly they would have? What happens next? Or? Well, I wonder if the frame is you're talking to a manager for potential representation and there's like a networking event and you're just saying, hey, I got an idea. I was just curious, what's the dynamic here? Um, then I'd be able to offer more specific uh, feedback. Okay, great. So we can take that scenario first and then we could take another one where I'm pitching, let's say, producers. So if I'm at a networking event and I've, I've met a manager and I tell them my idea, what would the feedback do you think? I think it's really going to depend on the manager's sensibilities. So, I mean, you know, who knows? They might love it or they might hate it, you know? So it depends on whether they think they would want to take on me as a client or whoever's pitching this idea and if they like this idea. I don't know if it's about, like, did Neely want to take on a potential client, but they might want you to sign a release for that script and send over that material so they can evaluate it. Okay, good to know. And then I, if I'm pitching a group of, let's say five producers and they've got their poker champion face on, their mm -hmm. shades and their and their hat, and I can't tell what they're thinking. They're mm -hmm. emotionless. Um, what would be some possible follow-up in the Q&A? Well, it depends. I mean, if it's pitching five producers, that feels like it might be like a, a networking event that was designed to expose new writers to producers. So I imagine that they'll be respectful and they might have questions and just kind of have a dialogue. Uh, it may be different than if you are working with those producers and then pitching like a financier. So the producers may be more um, animated, more, more verbal and engaged because it's not about you pitching somebody that's just going to press a button and get your movie made, they're going to first see if you're somebody that they might want to collaborate with and just kind of have like a back and forth. Because to get a movie made, is a, uh, it takes a long time typically. So they just want to know if they, they've, that you're on the same page and they like the idea. And then they also might request the script too. What would be some potential questions a financier might ask if I pitch this idea? I don't think that like they're going to just give you a 
quick answer, more likely that they're going to have a director pitch uh, the project and lead the pitch with a producer. So a writer at the point where a financier is involved, I may not say all the time, but at, once a project's mature enough for that to be the case, a lot of times a director is kind of really driving the pitches to potential financiers. And what if I'm pitching a production company? So I'm pitching them to sell my script, this idea to them. I mean, we're talking about like, let's say an environment where it's like a networking event that some script organization put on and you're pitching a production company. I mean, you're basically telling them the log line in a short period of time what you know and when you think about the log line you're thinking about why is this in differentiating it uh for this project from others so they you're basically trying to sell them a trailer to make them want to read the script so that's kind of the goal is that you're just saying hey got a really exciting project it's a time travel horror film what if somebody from our time was stuck in you know the age of witches and you know when they're doing the witch hunt what kind of scary things could happen during that you know and then that's it like you just give them a little pitch less is more if the pitch goes on too long and you lose their attention you just really want to know what the hook is and then punctuate that and let them ask questions your goal is to activate their imagination not to filibuster for like a long time about all these ideas. You, you, you really want to make sure that it's a conversation ultimately and not a monologue. So then they say, thank you very much. Hopefully they validate my parking. They show me out the door. I sit in traffic for two hours and I wonder, did they like it? I think I saw one of their eyebrows raise when I said this one thing. I think they liked it. Or I could tell this one guy, he had his lips pursed and his his hands crossed, you know, his he was, the hands crossed a bunch against his chest and he didn't like it. And I'm a, I'm a done deal. I'm finished in this town. I mean, you know, they're <laughs> like going it. home, you know, they like it if they asked um, for, you know, your email. So their assistant can email a script ah, release. I mean, okay. You, you know, it's not about reading a poker face at that point. It's pretty binary immediately. Do they want to read it? And I don't know what the, in this fictional, script event what the dynamic is and how it's you know ran but sure most likely if you pitch to these uh, participants and they're excited about it they're gonna get you to most likely write a uh, write write on a release um, that they get through maybe themselves or their assistant and then you send them the script i mean that's really what it is and then if they love it then they will want to work with you and that might be uh, an option agreement or a shopping agreement and some you know lock in the material and ideally pay you some money and then bring on the director and the actor so like it's really the starting point of a partnership if somebody you know reads it and likes it but that's what but it needs to start somewhere so if they ask for my email there's a possible second date I should assume. I mean, if they... We're going to Chili's. I mean, I think that if they have a script release, <laughs> I mean, if they get the script release mm -hmm. um, and then they get the project, you know, once you've signed it, there's no one's just going to ask for the script. And then if they read it and they like it, if you have a manager, an agent, they'll talk with them. And if it's just you, then you talk with the producer and they might send you deal terms about lo locking down the rights. And then you bring in, you get, you get a lawyer and you negotiate a deal. And then if you want to work with the producer, you close out the, the paperwork. And now you have a producer who's attached to the script. How would you shorten this pitch? I think that like the, the, the way into the time travel could be a little bit streamlined because once we get into the new location, the new time period. I think that's when the story becomes more interesting. Okay. So I just think that the the way into the time travel of it all 
you know, could need a little work. You're right, because I look at what I have written here that I read to you, and half of this paragraph is all set up. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's a great point, and thank you for that. So it I should just basically say, I mean, I, I kind of want to make it seem like this is the guy that his own creation got him into this. Kind of like a Frankenstein. Yeah, This exactly. is a monster. So what if it's just like a individual experimenting with technology goes wrong and then it becomes the horror film because now they're it got them in the wrong place and it's broken so now it's like survival yeah i guess i want a, a part where he thought he was above his own creation and that this would never happen to him but instead his own creation got him yeah i think that's something that could be elaborated but you do still need that thesis level pitch where you don't have all these extra details because they could kind of once you read the script they'll be revealed over time but i think the key is looking at the pitch as your trailer and that trailer instead of like when a movie is made is it gets you to pay for a ticket and watch it or download it at home or whatever stream it this instead is the trailer is getting you to read the script and that's what you're verbalizing has Hollywood run out of ideas, Peter? No, because you can't run out of human experiences. And everybody who's ever born looks at the world in a different way. Why do we hear that so much, though? We see it in our comments. We, we hear it all the time. That, that it seems that we've run out of ideas. We're only repeating the same story or IP over and over again. Depends where you look. I mean... I'm sure that it's also a taste thing because some movies get made more, some kind of character or genre, and there's an audience for that. But if we're adventurous, just go on Letterboxd. Like Letterboxd is like the coolest website around or app. And it just has so much exploration for movies. and. During the pandemic, I created a crime film club where I would curate movies to my friends. And some of them were, you know, in Asia and all around the world. And we, before we hop on a Zoom call, we'd watch one of these movies that I picked. And I used Letterboxd to find them. And every title, I tried to f pick something that was obscure and nobody's seen in the group because there are some cinephiles that are pretty hardcore. So but then it became like a fun challenge. Can I get something that they haven't seen? And I was successful. I, I found multiple movies that like the most hardcore crime film fans didn't ever hear of. And we had an incredible time talking about them. So I think the question is, are the movies that you feel are derivative, maybe it's the type of projects you just don't want to watch? That's fine. What about, you know, the onus is on you? Because, like, there's international cinema. There's incredible storytellers on YouTube. There's so many, you know, really interesting points of view. Or there's podcasts that have, you know, started being created in the audio drama space with stories from, you know, creators that we haven't been introduced to yet. But now they're here in a new medium. So... I think that line about there isn't enough X or whatever, I think that anybody who's commenting on that, they have a point to some degree because maybe they just don't like what's popular, but then they also have the responsibility to seek out what they find interesting. Well, taking it with music, since I know you're, you're a music aficionado, so a lot of people say, oh, well, there's no good music made after the 2000s or whatever. Would you say that they just haven't looked hard enough? That they haven't found some indie bands or different artists that they're they're still in this mindset of what was fed to us through radio back in the day, which has kind of gone away? I mean, maybe there's a band that they like and they broke up, or there was a movement and that isn't the the dominant one. You know, the artists are not pushing in that space, you know, pushing that space or it's not getting a lot of press. I mean, I can't say don't feel bad about the lack of 
the type of movies or music or you know writing that you've seen and you and it you see like it's just a desert you know and there's not an abundance of options i mean you should mourn that if that's the nostalgic quality i mean if you miss a certain type of thing i get that i can only speak to myself like i can't say this is what the industry is doing or not doing i could say that when i was looking for movies to entertain very cynical friends of mine who've seen everything and I found things that were very inspiring, that's from my own you know, experience. But if there is specific types of storytellers or stories that you don't see, that's a valid concern. I don't wanna deny that. I can only talk about within my own you know, range of experiences and you know, what I've seen, but then at the same time, if you don't see what, what's out there and you, it's kind of inspiration maybe for you as an artist because now there's more fuel to get you really plugged into a certain type of thing that it, that's missing. In some ways, I think art is kind of like criticism. If you make a movie that is a crime film that is directly, uh, diametrically like opposed to what's out there like if it's all about like 80s action films and then another style comes out that's different or a horror genre starts and it's all meta and that's the thing everything thinks about meta is that there's these different movements and sometimes a new movement upends an old one so if you feel you're not getting what you want and you're a storyteller maybe you're the one that sees something that needs to resurface that you like, or you see something that's not there ever and never been there, and you wanna destroy the current movement, you wanna put it into the passe, and this is your critique on it, then you should. You should destroy, you should, in a way, it's like you're kinda of becoming the next voice that's gonna resonate, and you might mean that you are in confrontation with the current, you know, fancy, you know, filmmaker, or author, or painter, and you're a necessary part of this, you know, the waves that will happen, you know, in our culture. And then you should bring upon change. You should fight to bring upon change because you don't like what's out there. And if you're not a creator and you're a critic, then you could attack what's out there. You know, or if you're just a commentator, you could comment on this YouTube video and that's still a critique of something. I mean, that's totally fine. I don't, I don't think it's all or one thing. I think it's a confluence of different perspectives. Yeah, it brings to mind this quote, um, we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. Exactly. So then when we complain that there's no more good movies anymore, there's no good music anymore, we can't, it's all been done before, it's really more on us. It, it's what, it's the filter that we're seeing it through and that maybe that means that we need to tell those stories. Well, I don't think people shouldn't be able to complain about what's out there. I think that's fine. I'm just saying that in some way, if you really don't like a certain way a genre is being explored by the current, you know, fancy people in the space who are getting all the attention, you might come out of left field and completely like ruck shop on it. Like there could be a <laughs> there could be a musician from SoundCloud that says, I hate what these DJs are doing now and electronic music they don't know what's going on and because of the the platforms are so much about amplifying anything that gets traction you might just in your parents basement make a song that gets attention and now you're challenging what's out there or you make a film for no budget it plays the festivals and then suddenly people go oh it's not about the thing that you don't like or if you're like i said if you're not a filmmaker you're just a writer, you just comment on every article. You're still there, you're still present, you're still pushing against something. It's okay to not be a fan of what's out there. You know, I think it's ridiculous if someone's like, just smile and consume everything. You don't have to. You could, you could just be annoyed that whatever you're really into is not being like embraced, but then you also have the abilities to be a thorn in the side of what's there, or potentially be a, a death sentence to that 
movement that you don't like, and maybe not a death sentence in the sense that it never could get reborn, but literally put it on hold, stop it, and then challenge it with your own voice. Uh, just be like a mindless consumer. You think that's what they want from us? I don't think anybody wants to be a mindless consumer. And I think that like the idea that there's a Hollywood movie and it's just, you know, doesn't take thinking to make a movie. Nobody who's making a movie is mindless. It's incredibly challenging, you know, task to do that. And there's so many people involved in the process that are brilliant. So I don't think a movie is just mindless. And I do think that a movie's goal is to have some type of reaction. You know, it's not, they don't want an apathetic audience that doesn't feel anything. They're, they're wanting to like create an experience that's memorable or at least not memorable. It makes you forget the challenges of your life. So, you know, I don't think that is idea that you just pour content down somebody's mouth and that's uh and that's what it what the system is it, it doesn't work that way it's it's a there's all it's basically there's all sorts of stories that are being told and some of them are being pushed to front and center some of them are more in the background and as time goes they shift uh based on the what's popular what's you know, the new cool, you know, the new cool voices, the new cool distributor, you know, what's A24 doing it? It just keeps shifting, you know, but it's your job to decide where you're participating in it, if you're commenting on it. And if you don't want to do anything else, you just think that it's bad. It's fine too. Like there's no, there's no responsibility for any individual regarding what level of, uh, in, you know, proximity they have to this uh, culture as a creator or a commentator. Excellent point. So we have free will. Of course, to an extent. And the algorithm doesn't follow us. And well, I mean, it, <laughs> it, it depends on how you um, consume content or movies or comic books or, I mean, like a, there's a spectrum of ex ways that you interact with media. Is it physical? Is it you're super nostalgic and you get DVDs and VHS? Are you getting them off Netflix? Are you getting them off Criterion? I just don't think there's like a one size fits all for anybody. And there isn't like just some psychographics that defines a giant chunk where everyone's like, all you do is watch these videos. Be because that's not true. I mean, I listen to certain types of podcasts, uh, watch certain kinds of movies, read certain kinds of journalism. Like I'm a very specific in that way. And there's other people that will be all about watching video games on YouTube or somebody's all about food. I think that like, there's this idea that like, there's the death of uh, what we of what we love or there's nothing here. Or, I do think that there's ways that journalists sometimes will create an absolute, like they'll say it's like, so I think they're creating the, and sometimes not all of them, obviously, but some of them have like a frame that's convenient because it invokes conversation. So it's like, how do I, how do I say something that's bombastic that gets you t talking? I mean, I know for a little while, uh, years ago, they were saying horror movies are dead. That was like an article. There was a few bombs or whatever, horror movies are dead. And then I was like, how's that true when the world at times is horrific? When the human experience could just be terrifying and confusing. How could horror movies be dead yet? We need an outlet to comment on this complex nature of our mortality. So there's no way, but at the same time, the journalists maybe just want people to talk about we're sick of schlocky horror movies. And maybe that's the protest. That's the, the writing. That's fine. But I just think that these type of frames on the grand scheme, as much as their conversation starters, if you take them too seriously, they're also limiting. We hear a lot about the 99% of screenplays written today are quote unquote horrible. What's been your experience with screenplays that you've read? Yeah, I don't think that like that many are like just total trash. I think that like for me, when I look at it as somebody to either like represent a writer or produce a project, that it it's not like something is the it's not, it complete completely 
not on the level. It's more, does it align with my taste? So I'm not being shocked by the, the bad scripts I'm reading. And maybe I'm not being exposed to really bad ones, but for whatever ends up on my to-do list to read, it typically is actually pretty good. There's never been anything where you were surprised that someone would submit something that wasn't finished? Well, I tend to not just take on submissions that the email doesn't perk my interest. I mean, I have to see a log line of something that makes me want to read it. And if it's presented professionally in the email, or I get a script from a trusted contact, or like a cover fly, or I find something on Blacklist, and it, it's got good feedback on it, it's probably pretty good. Like it's not, it's, there isn't a incredible deviation from what I'll imagine it to be to what it is and, the, and how horrible it is. What I rarely find is writing that gets me in the, in the mindset of, oh my God, this is something that I have to get involved with. That's the, the difference. It's not about, wow, it's all, it's all bad. It's more of like, what's gonna make me care more? Because I do have to look at all my other responsibilities. What, what's gonna make me wanna like open up space in my mental bandwidth and on my schedule to really get behind a project? That's what we're talking about. But it's not like I'm seeing so many bad writers and maybe through my filter systems, because I'm engaged with a network, maybe I'm just not seeing those. What do you think 99% of screenplays get wrong? I don't know what they get wrong because I don't know the ratio of scripts that I like. And then at a certain point, it's also a tasting because there are perfectly talented writers that will find managers uh, that have different tastes than mine, or I might find a writer that some other manager doesn't like. So I can't say in like a, as a number, in a sense that this percentage won't, won't get it. I could just say that it's just my sensibilities. And those things, those, those things are just like subjective and they guide my curation. So I can't tell writers to write exactly in the, in the way that I, connect with because that's their voice and that's how they want to write. So if there's something that I fall in love with, that's great, but it's just the stars aligning. So it's more of an organic uh, type of thing that I have as a, as a manager where I'm like, wow, this is really special and this is what I want to watch on TV or I want to see in the theater. And that's, more of that subjective taste than it is that there's just all these bad writers making mistakes. It's in the same way, like I, at home, I have unlimited options uh, to stream practically. What am I choosing to watch? Like that's more of a reflective of the sense of, are these, do I connect with these writers or not? Is what would I actually sit back and watch? What am I gonna, what am I gonna enjoy on the weekend? So, but I don't want to like speak to all these writers and say, look, you're all messing up as much as I have certain tastes that defines my, uh, my business. Can you explain meta to me? The, the sense that there is a, like, if you think about, I don't know, uh, Deadpool, there is a, a commentary on the superhero uh, genre within his you know, his, his performances, uh, his jokes, the, the character is constantly commenting on the, the type of world that he occupies. Or if you look at like Scream, the characters in some ways are commenting on the slasher genre. So, I mean, that's my, uh, I guess, you know, take on what meta could be. I'm sure there's ways to deconstruct that or explore that concept, but that's what initially comes to mind. Do you think that's more prevalent now? I do think that was definitely a movement in the horror genre and the with Scream. I think Scream was definitely 
an approach, but it's a device. So, I mean, I'm sure it's used across genres currently, but it's hard to like say if it's an exact wave that is starting to become dominant or it's picking up or it's just part of the, you know, the culture and we're just kind of experiencing it off and on, but it's not like there's all these meta creators that are just driving, you know, this movement. I don't know. How does a writer know they're too late to a genre? Like they're catching it when it's on its way down and it's been done too much and they think that it's a wave they want to ride, but the wave's are already about to crash. I think that like there's a pastiche that sometimes is popular and it's hard to really like have a handle on it exactly, but you just feel it. It's not an intellectual thing. You feel certain things like an ebb and flow of an approach, you know, but I don't think anything ever dies. I think it's just find another way into, um, into the minds of, of creators and audiences and maybe it's not the trending idea but it still exists i mean if you think about fashion you'll see fashion resurface all the time i mean everything is 90s now it's all you know yeah stonewash it's all about that you yeah, know it's and a good thing we saved the jackets yeah exactly <laughs> so you know 90s never died it's just there's just a it's always been ebbs and flows of ideas and identities and and types of characters and stories we see, but I don't think that anyone's too late to the party. I think the problem sometimes is that the 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 messaging to some script writers is is done almost like it's a, a tech startup where it's just like here's the space we got to occupy it. Oh no, this is crowded or you know, and it's this very business and very pragmatic uh, mindset that you apply to potentially another field. But I think that like, as a writer, you should write what you love and how much you align it with like being pragmatic, that's up to you or your reps. But I, I do think getting too caught up in the, the stock market or the trending of what entrepreneurs are selling this, it starts changing the mindset of, um, the creative process and it's very hard to write a script. So if you're looking at like deadline Hollywood or variety or any of those things and you're like, I got to write this or write that. I think that starts to become, you're becoming more reactive. And I think that to really develop your voice and really build out your, your, your portfolio, it's almost like you got to exert yourself onto the world and take up space and kind of push your ideas forward versus just, you know, counter punching, uh, because you're just dealing with things coming at you. And I think with that mentality, you know, maybe you do make some money, but you may not feel like you really own it and you may not feel really like it's yours. And I think it's way better to stick to what you're actually care about. Like if you really love campy, you know, rom-coms or whatever it is, and you know all about them, you should write to that. You should write to what you love because then you know it on a more specific level. You should write what you care about or else it's just like a weird, you know, weird game. And then it's more then you're playing the business of it. But that's not going to inspire people because you're not doing something that you're feeling. You're doing something that you're thinking. You're thinking that is everybody loves X or but I think you need to be able to be comfortable with the risk when you become a writer, then when you write a script, you might not sell it and that's fine. And there's no, there's no shame in writing things that don't sell. They might become a sample, but you don't want to be constantly being informed by trends or thought leaders and all that. You just want to write about things that you, that are on your mind that you can't get out of your mind, you know, and there might be a movie that you saw when you're younger, and that that movie is a movie that like inspired you to get into a game and you want to write to that, but it's passe, you should still write to it because that's what's getting you to write. It's your, every time you're in the game and you're creating something, you're learning. 
it's kind of like if you think about it, like if you're a martial artist, you're not precious when you work on your your discipline. You're just constantly perfecting it, perfecting it. Or if you're a chef, you're perfecting your cooking. And it's not like this is the best cheesecake ever that will end all cheesecakes and I can never do another one and that is it. No, you're just doing it and keep doing it and learning and learning and learning. And at a certain point, it may not be the projects that you think are going to be the ones that sell. Maybe it's further out that you've worked, 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 worked and then something locks in because you're not trying to protect your time so much. You're you're more learning because you're making yourself better. And as you get better and better, you're better for yourself just to generate alone. And you're also a better collaborator because you can articulate your thesis for uh, for what you're working on. And then they connect with that, who you're working with, and just build it out. So I think that it's not about protecting your 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 time by choosing some get rich quick scheme over talking about themes, talking about trauma that you've experienced or commenting on the types of, you know, TV shows you grow up on, those things should just drive you and should be your compass. That should always get you back to what makes you excited and just keep going back there and go back there and not look at it as like a cause and effect. Like I do this, I get that. You know, because that's the problem is that there's all these ideas of schemes and I'm going to do this. I'm going to make it work. There's so many professions that take a lifetime to learn and and they are accepted. You know, to be a lawyer, you don't just become a lawyer. You don't get like a certificate in the mail and so you're just a lawyer after like a, a week of studying law. It's these things take time. So I think the key is taking the pressure off your shoulders and just accepting yourself, accepting what you love and accepting what makes you different and just making anything, even if it's just an iPhone video or something you shoot on like on TikTok, it doesn't matter, or you writing tweets or you write short stories, it's just getting immersed in what you love and learning and trying to find friends that share the same you know, sensibilities and rinse and repeat and not thinking like I need a manager or I need an agent or I need this. No, you just need the platform that allows you to learn and sharpen your your perspective. And if you do these things, you become more valuable because then you become a specialist. You got to be okay with the most competitive quality of any storyteller is you got to be more me than anybody else. So that's what I'm saying. It's not to say I want to be the best writer or I want to be the best director. I, no, I want to be more me. And I want to feed those needs that I have to obsess over the directors that I fell in love with, the whatever is a comic creator or the musicians. And if you live in that space, you start picking up valuable skills. You start refining that way to speak. Now, when they say voice, it's like a signature. What is your voice? But they also say voice because you listen to my voice. You could hear what I'm trying to say. You're connecting with me. You're communicating. And it takes time, but then you communicate and it connects. If you see like your favorite TV shows and movies and everything, you're not looking at the low light reel of the creators. You're looking at the headlines. Do you know there's a low light reel to almost anybody? We don't always look cool. The richest people don't always look cool. The most successful artists don't always look cool. You're not seeing them fuck around making stuff that nobody cares about. We only see when it just everything just kind of clicks and then suddenly they're like amazing. And that's a problem with like the 30 under 30 or this and that is this obsession with time. We got to get here before this happens or we got to sell this project because time's running out. We have time. Until you're dead, you have time. So you should focus on becoming the most you version as a creator. And then if time goes by and somehow that manifests 
into making all this money and being the you know looking awesome that's fine or you don't become successful you just became obsessed with what you love and i don't think that's a tragedy either i think it's a tragedy when you're trying to do a performance art and pretend you're somebody that you're not trying to make things that you don't like i think that's the real tragedy i think that's a real waste of time